Good evening. Welcome. My name is Lynn Zinzer, and I want to welcome you to this night's of debate, which is part of the Chicago, uh, the Ayn Rand Center Chicago Speaker Series. The Ayn Rand Center for Individual Rights, located in Alexandria, is a public outreach and policy division of the Ayn Rand Institute. Chicago now has its own chapter of the Ayn Rand Institute here, and if you'd like more information about the chapter, then see me or contact events at aynrand.org and we'll get information to you. The Chicago chapter has sponsors these talks and make them possible. However, tonight's debate is also sponsored by the Brinson Foundation. Please join me in thanking all of these donors and sponsors for their generosity and their rational self-interest in funding these, this debate. We have two upcoming events for a change of pace on April 17th at this hotel. Tara Smith will be giving a talk on happiness. What is it? How can we find it? And focusing on three tools that will help us achieve happiness, but which are often disparaged or vilified and ridiculed. Come for an evening that should be informative, provocative, but not focused on politics. Then on May 3rd, we are hosting a fundraising dinner with a special guest speaker, Stephen Moore from the Wall Street Journal. For more information, again, contact events at aynrand.org. Now for tonight's debate. I am pleased to introduce the moderator, Eric Oliver. He's a professor of political science at the University of Chicago. He has written on a variety of topics, as evidenced by three books. Fat Politics, The Real Story Behind, or in, behind America's Obesity Epidemic, Democracy in Suburbia, and his most recent book, The Paradox of Integration, Race, Neighborhood, and Civic Life in Multi-Ethnic America. He will introduce the debaters and the format for tonight's event. Please welcome Dr. Oliver. Thank you all for coming out tonight, and thank you for inviting me to moderate this debate. Um, it's a pleasure to be invited. As a professor of political science, um, I spend a lot of time talking with my students about this very subject tonight, about what the role of government is. And it's great to be able to take this discussion out of the academy and out into a public sphere here. Um, it's also a pleasure to be here with our two speakers. Uh, and preparing to moderate for the debate, I, I was able to uh, read a little of both of their voluminous writings. And um, it's great to see two very well-reasoned and articulate viewpoints that come from very, very different perspectives uh, and address a lot of the really most kind of pressing and fundamental issues in our society today. Um, and so we're in for a real treat as far as having two, uh, two thoughtful perspectives that are going to be offered by very two very smart and articulate individuals. Um, Interestingly, although uh, both Yaron and David come from very different perspectives, there is a lot of commonality uh, to them. And I, I think hopefully as we exp both explore their differences, these commonalities will also become more apparent. Um, I think both of them share a very strong uh, commitment to uh, kind of normative elements in their work and the role of values in American society. Um, I think they both are very concerned about sort of promoting a good and just society. And I think both of them have a real passion for public discourse and the free exchange of ideas. Uh, to introduce both of them, uh, on the far left here uh, is David Callahan. David is a co-founder of Demos and edits the Demos blog on uh, policyshop.net. He's the author of eight books, including The Cheating Culture, Why More Americans Are Doing Wrong to Do Well, The Moral Center, How Progressives Can Unite America Around Our Shared Values, and Fortunes of Change, The Rise of the Liberal Rich and the Remaking of America. And there are numerous other books as well. Uh, he's also contributed pieces to the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Nation, and the American Prospect. 
David received his BA at Hampshire College and his PhD at, uh, uh, in politics at Princeton University. Um, to, in between us is Yaron Brook. Yaron is president of the Ayn Rand Center for Individual Rights. He's a regular contributor to Forbes.com uh, and has written for the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, and Investors Business Daily. Uh, he is co-author of Neoconservatism, an obituary for an idea, and a contributor to Winning the Unwinnable War, uh, America's self-crippled response to Islamic totalitarianism. Um, Yaron received his MBA and PhD in finance from the University of Texas at Austin. He was formerly a professor at Santa Clara University, and he is a co-founder of a financial advisory firm, BH Equity Research, of which he is presently managing director and chairman. So what I'd like to do for our debate uh, this evening is uh, we, are, we are addressing this topic, the role of government, which is sufficiently huge and something that we as human beings have probably been debating and thinking about as long as we've had governments. Uh, and in order to try to provide some manageability to this topic, uh, with both its broad themes um, and its individual applicabilities, um, what I'd like to do is, is set forth uh, a few questions both to, to both of our speakers to start off the debate. Uh, and probably for the next 30 minutes, uh, I will sort of be trying to structure their conversation by asking them some specific questions. Uh, at, after that point, uh, I'd like to open up the floor to your questions and your comments and we will hopefully engage this into a larger discussion. So um, let me start with Yaron. Um, Yaron, uh, you wrote, uh, and I, what I'd like to do is for both Yaron and David to start really on this general theme about what the role and the proper role and scope of government should be in society, uh, particularly in re regards to the economy. Um, you wrote, under capitalism, the government's sole purpose is to protect the individual's rights to life, liberty, property, and the pursuit of happiness from violation by force or fraud. This means the government is limited to three basic functions, the military, the police, and the court system. In a truly free market, there is no income tax, no alphabet agencies regulating every aspect of the economy, no handouts or business subsidies, no federal reserve. The government plays no more role in the economic lives of its citizens than it does in their sex lives. We now uh, live in a, well, we live, of course, in a very complicated industrialized economy, our post-industrialized economy. And so my question for you is, if this is your vision, um, and given the society we live in, say I buy some tainted meat and get sick, or my child is poisoned by, say, lead in his toys, or I'm swindled by a corrupt investment advisor. Is my only option in this, in this society that you would sort of see us live in to seek remedy in the courts? Is a truly capitalist society really then just a highly litigious society? And does that really provide us with some level of inefficiency? Or there, might there be real inefficiencies to be had through government regulation? So, let me get to the three examples you gave, tainted beat, bad toys, and uh, swindled by an investor. I think the three are different, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, but let me start by, by setting this principle. While I think that the system that I advocate indeed is more efficient than what we have today, that this so-called litigious society, I think it would be a lot less than what we'd expect, but the so-called litigious society, I believe, is more efficient. That's not the case I'm trying to make. Uh, I want to put efficiency aside for a second. And what I'm advocating is for principle. So the principle here is, as you mentioned in, in the quote for me, is the issue of force. I don't believe that anybody has a right to pull a gun and take my stuff, your stuff, anybody's stuff. And I don't care if it's a group or an individual or a very large group. I don't care how much they voted. I don't care the structure of the voting. They don't have a right to take my stuff against my will. And I don't care if that creates inefficiencies. I don't care if you don't like it. I don't care if most people don't like it. It's my stuff. Keep your hands off. Um, so that, to me, is the principle. Now, how does that all work out, right? So what happens? So I think that the tainted meats and the lead potentially are similar, but clearly the swindler is not. Swindle is a fraud. And in the example you read out, one of the things that I think government has a role in is catching crooks. So if the SEC has a legitimate function, it has only one, and that is to catch Bernie Madoff. So Bernie Madoff, the police should be looking for. They should, and they should actually catch him instead of 
looking at my 13 Ds and multiple other filings with them. They actually go after the crooks and catch them. So swindlers, there's a role for the government. The rest, yes, I think it is an issue of litigation after the fact. However, I also believe that the market provides mechanism, the mechanisms that would make our meat much safer and cleaner than it is today, make our toys much safer and, uh, and, and better and healthier, or however you want to uh, uh, describe it, than they are today. Uh, I would much rather rely on the market, the profit uh, motive of a variety of different entities, and we could take each one of those examples and describe the different entities that would have a profit incentive to keep our meat, I mean, start with McDonald's, who is not going to make money by killing its customers. It's just, you know, just ask any businessman. You don't get far with that. But they have an incentive to hire companies that then do screenings on meat. There's a whole chain of private enterprise that could fit in to, to replicate what the government does. And as private enterprise does, do it far, far better and more efficiently than does the government. And therefore, I think the occurrences of these things drop dramatically. And when on a rare occasion something slips, then yes, you have uh, the legal system to figure out was there negligence or wasn't there negligence and who are the responsible parties. If I could just follow up sure. briefly on this. Um, one of the, as, as an economics professor you would know, is one of the difficulties in a capitalist society and a capitalist economy has to do with information asymmetries. Yes. And as we get an increasingly complex economy where there's a greater distance between the producers of certain kinds of goods, for example, or even the producers of some kinds of services and the consumption of those services, those information asymmetries may generally increase. Now, if we rely on the market and we rely on market producers here, how do we deal with the function or the problems of these information asymmetries? Isn't there really a role for the state in helping kind of reduce a lot of the inefficiencies that might come from those information asymmetries? So again, my, my concern is not with efficiency. That is, uh, if the role of the state, if the state intervenes in order to take care of those inefficiencies by violating my rights, by taking something away from me, who's to say that reducing those inefficiencies in a, you know, is, is even in a utilitarian setting is somehow better than the damage they've done to me by taking my money or taking away some right. So I dismiss that utilitarian argument and I argue that there's a principle here. Force is wrong. It's wrong because I think force cripples the mechanism by which human beings survive and thrive and succeed and that is our reasoning capacity. Our reasoning capacity requires free choices. It requires our ability to think through options. What force does is it limits those options. It destroys our ability to actually think through problems. So it destroys that one faculty that our life ultimately depends on. So from a moral perspective, from an ethical perspective, it is wrong to force somebody to do something, even if you think it's in his, for his own good. It's wrong to use force on somebody, even when it's going to make them better in some, in some way. It's wrong to cripple their capacity to think for themselves and make those choices. But I also don't think it's less efficient. So, okay, I agree. They're going to be massive information asymmetries. They exist today. Um, there's money to be made <laughs> in bridging those information asymmetries. That's the beauty of the market. If there's real demand for that information, if the information is really critical, you would get private entrepreneurs entering the market for those information services to provide them and compete, and compete based on who provided the best information versus what we have today, which is a, a, a force-imposed monopoly, where you cannot compete with those information providers, and therefore the information provided is very mediocre. Just look at our rating agencies who have an oligopoly you know, designated by government and providing information on you can't compete with them, you can't start a rating agency, I can't start a rating agency, it, we can't compete. And even though they were wrong on Enron and wrong on Orange County and wrong on the uh, uh, mortgage-backed securities, there's no penalty. They haven't gone bankrupt, they haven't got, there's no penalty because everybody has to use them. <laughs> you can't not use them, they're the only three that the government has approved. So I would like to see a real competitive market in information. And I think that the market is healthy enough and broad enough and entrepreneurs are creative enough to create such a market. Let me address one other thing that you've brought up twice in both the questions. It's the issue of complexity, because I find it fascinating. To me, the more complexity you have, the less government you want. And this, this goes back to Hayek's argument about, you know, if it's really complex, 
Giving it to one bureaucrat or one regulator to figure it all out is impossible. He can never accumulate. This is the problem of knowledge. He can never accumulate the knowledge, but it's not just pure knowledge. It's everybody's, everybody's values estimation, everybody's utility function, if you will, for their own life, everybody's you know, trade-offs that they're making. And now you want to aggregate all that to one guy who then has to decide which information is good and which information is bad and make decisions for people. The more complex a system, the more you want to leave it to individuals to figure this out on their own and to create situations where innovation and competition lead to optimal results rather than trying to bureaucratize this, the, the, the content. Yeah, great. That, that's, that's a nice point because it segues into my comment for David. Uh, David, recently you wrote, one reason why more government and more prosperity can go hand in hand is because public spending can help prime growth through strategic investments that spur long-term national prosperity. Now, to be sure, too much of the wrong kind of government spending can slow economic growth. But what are the reasons why expanded public investments in education, infrastructure, and new technologies, as Obama has called for, would reduce national wealth in the long run? I can't think of any. So my question for you is, uh, well, what, how would we deal with something like Solyndra, for example? Would that be an example of this? And more broadly, why should we have any faith that political institutions are better at allocating resources than markets? Shouldn't the failure of a lot of centrally planned economies give us reason to be skeptical of government e efforts to manage economic growth? Yeah, well, let me just st say, for starters, it's great to be here. Thank you for moderating this debate. I'm a longtime admirer of your work. Great to debate with Yaron. Yaron and I have debated a, a number of uh, times before, so uh, we know each other well at this point. And, uh, and I, I guess to, to start to uh, answer your question uh, ma and make a, a broad framing remark, um, one of the problems I've had in, in, with Yaron's uh, arguments through the course of our debates is the way in which he is arguing with success. Because over the past 60 years or so, uh, roughly since World War II, a balance between government and the private sector has pretty much been the norm in the wealthiest parts of the world. We've had, you know, whether you look at the United States or Western Europe, uh, there's been uh, a very robust, very robust markets and also a strong role for government. And that model, which became dominant after World War II, has actually been phenomenally successful. We have. I mean, the United States became, has become, in the last 60 years, the richest country in the history of the world with that model. Europe is the second, uh, the second wealthiest uh, zone in the world. And China, which has a very strong uh, role for government, um, a role which has expanded uh, 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 you know, in, in terms of its sort of uh, management of industrial policy, China is, is well on its way to becoming uh, one of the wealthiest uh, countries in the world, too. So, so, so you know, I admire Iran for his strong principles and for uh, his, uh, his belief that it's all about the, the principles and the moral principle, but, but the historical record is pretty clear that a mixed economy has produced high levels of, of wealth. And to put that model at risk for the sake of a, of, of a set of, of moral principles, I think, is highly highly uh, risky and questionable. And I would take, I would take real issue with the principles uh, themselves. Yaron says, you know, I don't want force. I don't want anybody taking anything from me that is mine by force. You know, my wealth that I have made through my business, say. I don't want government coming in and taking my wealth. But the fact is, is that nobody makes money in business by themselves. Right, we're not, we, we don't operate in some total vacuum. We make, we create wealth because we live in a society that is a complex and interdependent society. You know, you can't make any money uh, without roads and infrastructure and educated, uh, educated workforce and the court systems and, and uh, all sorts of kind of basic foundations of, that, that make it possible to create wealth. So. So you can't, you can't make your wealth in a complex society with all these forces that support you and make that happen and then say, no, it's all mine. Because that just doesn't reflect reality. So I have a, a, a major problem with that, uh, 
that idea that, you're, that Yaron espou often espouses in these discussions. As for your specific question about the role of, of public uh, investment in spurring economic growth, I mean, that's one of the areas where the historic record in the United States is, is, is quite clear. I mean, if you think about the role of public investment in, in kind of creating the modern middle class uh, in the wake of World War II, it's been, it's been huge. I mean, we had, after World War II, the GI Bill, which offered subsidized mortgages to, to the, you know, millions of people who fought in World War II. That helped create this huge boom in the housing market and the creation of suburbia, uh, the home mortgage interest deduction, which helped spur home ownership. The suburbs were also opened up by massive investments in public transportation through the interstate highway system. Uh, our workforce became a lot more educated and creative thanks to the creation of the, of the public university system, you know, the, the higher ed public university system, which still three out of four students in this country go to, has, has w was dramatic piece in terms of creating this more prosperous, uh, prosperous society. And you know, I could go on with other examples, the, the investments in science and basic research and technology. I mean, Silicon Valley, a lot of that started out as government spending through the, through the Navy and research and development. There's so many examples of, of where government science and, and uh, uh, technological investment has been really pivotal there. Yes, you, know, you do get the occasional cylindras or things that, that don't work out so well. There, there is a risk of crony capitalism, the system can be kind of uh, uh, co-opted by special interests and, 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 you, and you have inefficiencies that way. But you know, there's lots of problems with the private sector as well. I mean, lots of, uh, of, of things that don't go so, so well. And I'm willing to take, take some of those risks and I think we need efforts to, 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 to manage those to keep them at bay. But, the, but the, in the grand scheme of things, the historic record I think is clear that public investments uh, pay off in terms of building prosperity. Certainly, our global competitors understand that. I mean, the Chinese, uh, I mean, you look at what they're doing in terms of public investment, it is phenomenal. They're building 8,000 miles of high speed rail to link all of their major economic centers. They have the most advanced airport systems, airports in the world. I mean, they, they're, they're building these major research universities. They understand that the state has a strong role in promoting prosperity, and they are our competitors in the, right now and in the future. If I could follow up just briefly on that, though. Um, if we look around the world today, sure, China seems to be booming, although some people say that you know, they have had a, a bubble in terms of infrastructure and infrastructure development, and you know, there's a question about whether, how much of their economic growth has been just propped up by building thousands of miles of high-speed rail network. And if we look at Japan with its sort of really kind of stagnant economic performance uh, over the past 15 years, or the European crisis and the, and the crisis around the euro and sort of uh, sovereign debt, you know, a lot of people would say, well, these are examples that where governments in these cases have been captured by special interest, as you noted. And it's the political capacity of certain groups to basically use government to, towards, to, to, towards their own ends, which ends up you know, generating what might be, in the long run, really kind of catastrophic consequences for these advanced industrialized democracies. What would be your response to that in terms of, is there something about the role of government in an advanced industrialized democracy that puts us at greater risk for special interest capture and then all, you know, maybe ultimately kind of long run dysfunction? Yeah, I mean, sp certainly with a democracy, you have the, the, that risk because of the nature of pluralism. You have highly organized interest groups that can, that can get their piece of the pie and then never let it go. You know, it's like those farm subsidies, right? That at one point made sense, but then, you know, the farmers fight to the death to protect those, those subsidies. Or even something like the home mortgage interest deduction, which I think at, at one point and you know really played a role in stimulating the, the, the rise of the middle class and, and, and housing, but try to take that home in mortgage interest deduction out and you're going to be up against the, the National Association of Realtors, which is like a very, very powerful interest group. So certainly there are some risks of that kind of capture and cronyism. I think in general the United States has managed to, to, to um, uh, play that balance pretty well. I mean we, we 
have had a lot of big successes with this public university system, with modern infrastructure, with the science and uh, government's role in, in science. So I'm, I, I, I think that we need stronger campaign finance rules. We need stronger controls of lobbyists and what have you uh, to, to deal with that risk. And in my view, the risk is worth running for the prosperity that that kind of strategic role of government can play, uh, especially now when we're up against countries that have that, that, that model. Yaron, would you like to briefly respond to David's comment? Sure. You know, I, I think there's, uh, we're going to disagree here on history uh, and in what causes, uh, you know, success in an economy. Uh, it's true. The last 60 years have been incredibly successful. And uh, I would say that is in spite of government policies, government growth, uh, government, so called government investments. I don't consider them investments. They're just, uh, you know, there's small benefits, but uh, on a net present value, I, my guess is they're mostly negative. Um, but let's look at the last 60 years. Um, so, post World War II, government shrinks dramatically because we go for war footing. Um, you know, massive amount of people uh, join uh, the workforce, uh, which, is, which is a great thing. Uh, the, economy, the economy booms in the, in the, in the, in the late 40s. Uh, I mean, there's a bit of a recession in the late 40s, but it booms into the 50s. It does very well. Government then starts growing again in the 60s dramatically. And what do we get? We get a period of 15 years, 16 years of basically stagnation. You know, if you take the mid-60s to the 1982 and you look at most, a lot of economic indicators across that period, uh, starting with the Dow Jones Industrial, it's basically flat for 16 years. Uh, because government has grown too big and it's gone out of control. And the remedy to that is not even Reagan. It's under Jimmy Carter, massive deregulation. The real deregulation that happens is Jimmy Carter. He never gets credit for this. But if you think about airlines, trucking, uh, uh, financial, uh, financial institutions, brokerage, and if you look at the decline in capital gains rates, that's all Jimmy Carter. And then you get Ronald Reagan in there continuing to deregulate and cutting taxes. And yeah, the economy, the economy does better under those conditions. When you get government out of the, out of the equation, the economy do, does very well. But then, of course, the government grows again, and it starts so-called investing, and it starts manipulating, and it starts incentivizing us maybe to buy more homes than we should. And you get, you get the end of, of, uh, of Bill Clinton and the beginning of George Bush, who is you know, big government, as, as big as any liberal is. No deregulation. I, I challenge anybody to, to look at George Bush and find what he deregulated. He, massive regulation, Sarbanes-Oxley, new regulations across the board. Uh, you know, yes, he cut taxes, but other than that, he was a big government, big government guy. And yes, we get a big financial crisis, and now we're, we've entered. If you look again, at least in financial measures, if you look at the last 15 years, we've been flat. So I would argue that, yeah, when we allow a little bit of freedom for the, to the marketplace, when we deregulate, when we lower taxes, when we let people actually innovate and do their thing, we get huge successes. Standard of living goes up, wealth goes up, good stuff happens. When government gets out of control, bad things happen, whether it's the 70s or whether it's today. I'd also say this, <laughs> you know, just look at our educational system, including higher education. 75% of all masters and PhD degrees in the United States in the sciences and engineering are earned by foreigners. Americans don't do masters and PhDs in sciences and engineering. That to me is a, is a black mark on, on our public educational system. Uh, the schools in California are going bankrupt. The, 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 the struggling students can't afford to attend them and the schools can't stay open anymore because they're run by a politicized process, not by an economic process. And you could go on and on in terms of the failures of the educational system instead of privatizing it all and bringing the kind of innovation and competition that we have in other markets to the educational market. And let me just make one point, because David's made this many times, and I can't remember if I responded or not. His point about, um, uh, about you don't do it alone. You don't do it alone. It's true. You don't do it alone. You've got employees, but you pay them. You've got suppliers, and you pay them. Yes, you drive on public roads today, but in my world, they wouldn't be private. They'd be, they wouldn't be public. They'd be private, and there'd be a mechanism to pay for that as well. And there'd be a mechanism to pay for the stuff you get. Yes, we don't do it alone, but for everything that we get from other people in a capitalist society, you trade. So I want to shift human relationships from I've got a bigger gang than yours, therefore I get to tell you how to live and what to do, to 
Human relationships that are based on trade, in other words, based on win-win relationships where people enter them voluntarily. They are not cursed into it, but an exchange is voluntary exchange. So I'd like to move to a voluntary society from a society that uses force on some dictated by others based on it, usually a majority. David, would you like to respond? Well, I, you know, I don't think that the experience of most, that most people have who are uh, you know, running a business or doing uh, something in our society is that there's a gun to their head. I mean, I think that, that uh, for, for many people, the system of these public goods and uh, sharing some of the wealth that they create to help strengthen those public goods and those public systems doesn't feel coercive. It, it feels like a sensible system. And, and, and I think that's, that's the reason why we have this system, because we live in a democracy. People have chosen this system. You know, uh, it, it's funny. Americans may not uh, like or trust government in the abstract, but they support individually pretty much all the things the government does by a pretty strong margin. And particularly infrastructure and education, two sort of very vital public goods that Iran would, would privatize, have very strong support in the United States and have for a long time. I mean, people, people find that this makes sense to, to have those kinds of large systems be systems that, uh, that, we, that we create as a society together and, and then maintain through our tax dollars and through us each making a contribution to, to make sure that they're robust. The system has largely worked. It's largely supported by Americans. I think Iran would, would readily acknowledge that his view is, is pretty far outside the mainstream. Well, on, on that, I'd like to move to the topic of health care. Uh, as we all know, the Supreme Court right now is hearing oral arguments about the Affordable Care Act. And um, what I'd like to hear from you, David, is speaking of sort of public opinion, um, when, you, when most Americans are polled about the Affordable Care Act, uh, most either there's a plurality in favor of rolling back the entire act and a majority in favor at least rolling back the individual mandate, which is sort of at the core of the court case right now. How does that square then with your ideas of sort of uh, kind of collective values and coming yeah. together uh, with respect to this issue of health care? If the majority of Americans really seem to not be in favor of kind of a collectivized solution to kind of health care problems. Well, healthcare is actually a, a, a pretty good example of what I was just talking about, of people not liking government in the, in the, in the abstract, but liking it with the individual things that it, it does. It's true if you ask Americans, do you like the Obamacare, uh, you know, a, a majority will, will say no. But then if you ask them, you know, do you think it's a good thing that insurers can't uh, discriminate against people with pre-existing pre conditions, a large majority will say yes. If you ask them, do you think it's a good thing that you know, low-income people who can't afford health care should get subsidies to buy health insurance, a large majority will say yes. If you ask them, do you think it's a good thing that, you know, the, the donut hole in the med in Medicare prescription uh, is, is being filled, a large majority will say yeah. People like all of the specific things that this health care does, this bill, this law does. On the, 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 the individual mandate, the mandate sounds very ominous, you know, government, gov government uh, telling uh, people what to do, but in Massachusetts where they have it, it's found very wide acceptance, and one of the reasons that people come to like the individual mandate once it's been around longer and they get to understand it more is because what the individual mandate basically does is it says to the free riders in the system, the people who don't buy health insurance because you know they don't think they're going to get sick, they say, hey, you got to kick in. You can't just, you know, go without health insurance and then when you get sick use Medicaid or go to the emergency room uh, which drives up which drives up expenses for everybody I mean wh wh what happens we all pay for the free riders the people who are healthy and don't have health insurance don't buy health insurance when they get sick we all pay because we don't yet let's let people in this society die uh, when they're sick if they don't have insurance so we all pay and what the mandate does it, is it says no you guys can't be a free rider. You have to kick in, pay what you can. And when people understand that more, they come to support it as they have in, in Massachusetts. So I think that if, you know, if um, uh, Romney did win the election and, and set out to uh, overturn Obamacare, I, I, my guess is people would suddenly, the, the Republicans in Congress would suddenly get very skittish because they'd realize that most of the elements of the health care law 
uh, the individual elements are strongly supported by Americans. Now, Yaron, you've written about health care, and you have said, uh, and I quote here, um, contrary to the claims that government-imposed universal health care would solve America's health care problems, it would, in fact, destroy American medicine and countless lives along with it. The goal of universal health care, a euphemism for socialized medicine, is both immoral and impractical. It violates the rights of businessmen, doctors, and patients to act on their own judgment, which in turn throttles their ability to produce, administer, and produce the goods and services in question. Now, uh, the Europeans have had an experience with uh, socialized medicine now for several decades. Um, they seem to enjoy great health. They don't seem to have had a destroyed medical system. Uh, how would we, how do we evaluate your comments uh, in this right, in light of sort of the experience of what seems to be a relatively successful European experience with? So I would very much challenge the success of those systems. Uh, and uh, now they're popular, they're popular in Europe. The British love their health system, the French love their health system. You know, and I agree with David, Americans would take Obamacare if, if stripped to its details, I, I agree completely. Um, the problem with the European system and the Canadian system is that they're great systems from a practical perspective when you're healthy. And most people are healthy most of the time. It's when you're sick that it's a problem. Uh, and the statistics are quite astounding in terms of the British healthcare system, the French healthcare system, the Scandinavian healthcare systems, in terms of rationing, in terms of waiting lines, uh, in terms of every measure when you're sick. Of, and, and particularly when you're uh, sick of a disease that is likely to kill you, like cancer or, or, or heart disease, there is, and this is unequivocal, there is no better healthcare system in the world to be in when you're really, really sick than the American healthcare system. So survivorship, su uh, surviving cancer by huge percentages is much greater in the United States than any other system. Surviving heart disease by huge numbers is better here than it is, uh, than it is in any other healthcare system. So even though we live less healthy lives than Europeans do, we tend to be obese, we tend to have all these other uh, problems, if we get sick, we actually get far better treatment than they do. And, and, and you know, the best anecdotal evidence of this is when leaders of these other countries get sick, where do they take them? They bring them here. My father was a doctor, uh, is still a doctor. Um, in a socialized healthcare system, in Israeli healthcare system, and when he has a patient who can afford it and who is really, really sick, and Israel has more doctors per capita than any kind of the country in the world. I mean, it's a Jewish country after all. Um, <laughs> where does he take them? To the Mayo Clinic. He, he doesn't treat them in Israel. So when there's an opportunity, then you bring them over here. When, when Berlusconi gets sick, he doesn't go to France, which supposedly has the best healthcare system in the world. He doesn't go to the UK, he comes to the US. Uh, when the king of Saudi Arabia, you could go on and on. Uh, the point is that we have, we have a segment of our healthcare system. The, the, our healthcare system is broken. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna pretend that our healthcare system is healthy. It's not, it's broken. I just don't think we should emulate systems that are more broken than ours, based on public opinion. I think we should look at facts, and then we should look again at principle. And, and you know, the principle is freedom. And the problem with the American healthcare system and the problem with the healthcare system of the world as a whole is there's not enough freedom. There are not enough choices. There are not enough innovation. There's not enough market. There's not enough real insurance and taking away pre-existing condition. Basically, there is no insurance. All, all insurance companies become as third-party administrators between the government and, and, uh, and all of us. So it's a sham to even call it insurance. Um, so, you know, the, let's move towards a better healthcare system, which is one in which respects individuals, and one in which we have real choices, and one in which health insurance is as cheap as a cell phone bill, and who can't afford a cell phone? Find me those people. Almost everybody has a cell phone. Health insurance does not have to be expensive. Healthcare does not have to be expensive if you get government out of it. It's no accident that the two areas where we're seeing the most price inflation are healthcare and education, the areas that are dominated by government. The, the, you know, over 50 cents of every dollar spent on health care spent by government. Um, so, so I think the solution is, and, and it, you, could, you could go through a whole plan, it's not hard to do, on how do you privatize the system and move away from a Canadian and English. And the English system is breaking down, and the German and other systems are going to break down, you know, as, as, as you see fewer and fewer young people, and you've got a huge demographic problem in Europe. Fewer and fewer young people and more and more old people and, and the redistribution of wealth 
become so massive that they can't deal with it. So those systems are heading towards even more decline. But I wouldn't exchange our whole system. I mean, I just had back surgery. I saw eight different specialists to get an opinion. The insurance company paid for all of them. I, uh, I had the best you know, surgeons in a, in a wonderful hospital, incredible treatment. I, when I needed an MRI, I got an MRI that day. My brother, who had a very similar problem that I did, had to wait four weeks from MRI, even though his father's a doctor. In, in a, I mean, it's just, you have to live in another country. You have to live in one of these socialized medicine countries to realize how good you have it here. Again, if you can afford it, and I would argue that a lot of people can't afford health insurance in America today because of government, not because of the private sector. The private sector would drive down costs, not increase costs. And just one last thing. 75% of all medical innovation happens in the United States. 75%. We're a fraction of the world in terms of population. But 75%. If you bring socialized medicine to this country, you kill medical innovation. The reason you have the innovation here is because, uh, because doctors are free. Because, because we have freedom in medicine today. Uh, and if you take that away, not only do we suffer in this country, but the world suffers, because they benefit from the innovation we produce. We export it, right? Uh, they don't pay for it, not really, because it's ideas, it's not stuff. So you kill not only us, you kill those socialized systems that we're subsidizing all over the world. Your Honor, if I could follow up on this, uh, and this goes to a sort of a larger question about sort of freedom and values with respect to social services. Now, you've described the welfare state as morally bankrupt, um, and yet we see that you know popular support for you know spending things like Social Security and, and Medicare are incredibly high. Over 85 percent of the public strongly em em embraces these programs. To what extent is are is their embrace of the programs an expression of their freedom? If we think of the United States as a free state. The similar th question I would have for you, in the kind of system, for example, we stay with health care, and we imagine that you know, we have just a free market of health care, and some people just simply can't afford or don't get health coverage in some ways. You know, um, a lot of my researchers in the psychology department at the University of Chicago have been doing research on compassion and shows that we're really hardwired for compassion. We have these things called mirror neurons, where basically, if you are suffering, I will suffer by seeing your suffering. When we start thinking about freedom and values with respect to the welfare state, why wouldn't our embrace of sort of a collectivist solution for a lot of social problems be, in fact, an expression of kind of inherent values? Why isn't building Medicare or Social Security an expression of our freedom? So this goes to the heart of, I think, a disagreement that, that David and I have, and I have granted with most people, right? not just with David. Um, and that is on the relationship between the individual and society and what that relationship is. See, I believe that individuals join into a society when they do so. It is wrong for them to give up any freedom, and there's no reason that they give, should give up any freedom. That indeed what they gain by joining a society are all those benefits from trading with other people and benefiting from the brilliance and productivity and and, uh, you know, and, and friendship and so on and love that they get gained from other people in a trade relationship. But they don't give up anything by doing that. They continuously trade and it's a win-win for everybody so that individualism is completely compatible with a social perspective, but it's a society of traders, a society of people in that society exchanging with one another voluntarily. The alternative view of society is that society is everything, that the essence is society. And the individual is, you know, a cog in a sense. And now that's a dramatization. Nobody actually would say that, right? But it's okay for him to give up freedom. It's okay for him to be forced to do stuff he doesn't want because there's this greater good. There's this society. And I think that is wrong. It's evil and immoral, right? It's, it's just, it's, it's wrong. And this is the, the founding principle of this country. The founding principle of this country was that you own your life. Your life is yours. You have a right to it, to pursue it, to do with it as you will. And nobody has the right to, to, to obstruct that, to prevent you, to force you to do things against your will. So to me, that is the principle. Every other state, including Europe today, every other state is built around this foundation. That society is everything. And society gets to decide your fate as an individual. You're nothing. What matters is the group, matters is society. The founders rejected that and created, and that's what makes this country unique. In that sense, I'm an American except, exceptionalist, if you will. This country is unique in that it placed the individual first. And I think that is the principle that has to guide us. So 
it's, it's wrong. It's, it's, in my view, yeah, people think that they can think and do whatever they want, including to mug me, right? So we understand when it's one-on-one -on -one that somebody does not have a right to so-called express his freedom by mugging me. We also know that he can't express his freedom by hiring the mafia to mug me. But somehow it's okay if he gets together with the neighborhood and they vote and 51% of them want to mug me, then it's okay. But that's exactly what happens. That's but, exactly what happens. Now, they don't physically come and punch me, but if I don't play by the rules, what do they do? Are, they, are stop signs a violation of my, my rights? <laughs> Stop signs would exist in, if the roads were private. So in, in a sense, what the, the, the government is, is interceding to do something the market would do anyway. So no, I don't think it's a violation. But I do think that having public roads is a violation of my rights, yes. Because, because it's taken my money to build them. So in that sense, stop signs are an extension of that. But you know, I'm not going to get too upset about a stop sign because that is something that would exist in a free market. But for me, to subsidize everybody, other people's health care, for me to subsidize their retirement, for me to subsidize you know, a, a whole myriad of things that the government forces me to do today, or for me to change my investment behavior because the government has decided that it doesn't want me to do what I do today. You know, I just heard bad news about how Dodd-Frank you know, affects my investment business. You know, that's a mugging. I now have to devote a huge amount of my time away from the pursuit of my happiness to fulfilling a bureaucrat's need. My clients aren't complaining. My clients are quite happy with the current arrangement. I have to change it completely because somebody decided in Washington that the way I do business is wrong, is offensive to them. They're not accusing me of fraud. They're not accusing me of violating anybody's rights. It's just it, they think my clients would be better off after a different arrangement. They're not asking my clients if they're better off or not. That's not the point. It's not us choosing and making voluntary decisions. Somebody is imposing their will on me. That, to me, you can't gain freedom by taking somebody else's freedom. That is the essence of immorality. It's immoral to impose your will on others by force. And that's what we do when we place society ahead of the individual. And that's applicable to all of those programs that you described. Now, David, on values, uh, you've written, Americans, sh Americans shouldn't leave their destiny in the hands of private market actors who are growing more powerful. Instead, People should come together to protect the human values that we share. And when I think about this, I think about, well, what are some of the values that we share? And we've talked about some of the values that are popular uh, here. But we, if we look, and as a, as a progressive, I think you might be concerned about some of the values that Americans share. Americans share a lot of very unprogressive values with respect to things like, for example, um, race relations for a long time. We were you know, horribly unprogressive on that uh, with respect to gay marriage, with respect to, say, for example, abortion rights from a perspective. You know, perspective. Um, are you concerned about coming together and sort of sharing values in terms of what values will kind of dis de determine who gets shared? And you know, here in Iran's comments, I'm reminded of the quote that's often misattributed to Ben Franklin, which is democracy is you know, two wolves and a lamb deciding on what to have for lunch. And I'm wondering that about, you know, with respect to values, yeah. you know, who are the, the wolves of, you know, I think in, if we look at our, our mass society, there are a lot of illiberal values that Americans share. And if, if we are coming together to protect those values, will we become a more illiberal kind of society? Yeah, I mean, the, this is certainly an area where you have to strike the right balance. And I think this is one role that the Bill of Rights has played in our society, which was when the founders set things up, it was... You know, the, 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 the purpose of the, of the Bill of Rights was to make sure that there are certain sacrosanct individual rights that could not be violated, no matter what the majority said. So I'm not advocating that the majority, you know, should get to call the shots uh, 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 on anything and everything. And I, and I think that over time, uh, through uh, the, uh, uh, the evolution of our understanding of rights, a lot of uh, liberal values have been kind of uh, struck down by the or pushed back by the courts, such as, say, the, the, the uh, uh, prohibition against uh, interracial marriage. Um, but I, I want to come back to this question uh, about values, about compassion. And you, know, you talked about your, your, the researchers who are looking at how compassion may be hardwired. I do think that, that empathy for others is a very strong uh, human emotion. Most of us feel it. And, uh, and one of the things these researchers are, are suggesting is that it's also that, that it's so strong in us because it was a um, 
you know, necessary for survival, that, that when you felt empathetic with others and when you cooperated with others, you were more likely to survive. And, and so that, that kind of a cooperation and empathy are kind of key uh, 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 tools that people developed in order to sur survive. So they're not going away as, as part of the human condition. And I do think that, that a lot of the, the social safety net that we have developed is a result of, of that, those feelings of, of empathy and compassion. And it is, it is a big reason why it, 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 it enjoys such strong support uh, among Americans, you know, whether it's Social Security, uh, people overwhelmingly support, or, or, you know, even something like food stamps. Um, and, uh, uh, it, it, and so I think that that's just important to keep in mind that this is not stuff that has been sort of imposed by government. You know, government, we're a democracy. Government is our tool to do things together uh, that we can't do as individuals or that the markets can't do or that charity can't do. And as a, a, as a democracy, we've chosen to express our empathy and compassion for others through these social insurance systems. You know, could they be? Could those systems be more efficiently run or, or better structured? Uh, I'm sure some of them could. No question about that. Um, but I also disagree with Yaron that that those systems are are basic violation of of human freedom. It, in fact, you know, as I read the sort of recent history of America, you know, I think people have come to feel that they have a lot more individual freedom and rights in this society over the past 50 years. I mean, basically, we see the rise of sort of the modern brand of individualism starting in the 60s, people kind of telling the, whether it's the church or, or uh, other kinds of traditional institutions that you can't tell me what to do. Uh, you know, this country is a lot more free than it was uh, for individuals to sort of lead their own lives than it was 50 years ago. And that that has coincided uh, with, the ex with a significant expansion of government. So, so the idea that government always makes us less free, I think is just not borne out by, by the recent historical record. I also have some remarks to make about healthcare, uh, but maybe you have a follow-up. Well, um, what I'd like to do is I, I would like to open this up for questions uh, in a moment. And while maybe people are thinking of their questions, uh, and I invite you to, to come up, uh, sort of one last topic. And, um, and, I, and I, would, I would just pose this to both of you. Uh, I've written a, a lot about obesity and the social construction of obesity as a health epidemic. And one of the reasons, probably the best evidence we have of why Americans have gained so much more weight over the past 30 years has really been the liberalization of our food economy. If we think about the way that people ate, in the 1960s, we ate at three meals a day at very shared time in a very constrained way. Uh, we had a very set menu for breakfast, a certain very limited kind of menu for lunch, and we had a kind of a very constrained menu and set time at dinner. And what we've really seen over the past 30 years has been this explosion of individualism in our food consumption. We now can eat just an amazing variety of foods. And what's most importantly, and I think the reason why we've gained so much weight is how much we're eating in between meals. We're snacking quite a bit, and we have our double mocha frappuccino while sitting in our car driving to work, and all is great. And not surprisingly, we've gained a lot of weight. And so the, my question to your, your on this is, does necessarily individual liberty always provide a good for us? Are, are we always necessarily capable of kind of restraining our own impulses? Is the growth of obesity, uh, in fact, indicative of some of kind of the hazards of increasing liberalization of certain dimensions of life. <laughs> <laughs> Look, there are no guarantees that people will make the right choices in life. Uh, and, and this is part of my point, is I don't think anybody can make those choices for other people. I think that the essence, the essence of life is figuring out what's good for you, rationally pursuing those values that are good for you. I don't believe there's such a thing as shared values. I mean, we each have values. There are commonalities between those values, but they're our values. Each individual has to choose their values and pursue them. And we make mistakes, and we do things wrong. But that a system that allows individuals choices is a far better system for those individuals, even when they make bad choices, than is a system that regiments those choices. Now, let me give you an example with regard to food. Uh, and, and I'm going to make a hypothetical here, which I don't know is true, but that some people, some scientists have advocated, you know. Uh, some people claim, and I've read a, a couple of books on this, that the reason we're obese 
is not because we eat too much meat, but because we meat, eat too much carbohydrate. That we eat grains that are bad for you. you, might, you know, and I'm not an advocate for this. I don't necessarily believe this. But there's a diet out there called paleo, right? And it says that the way we evolved genetically was to, eat, to be carnivores, and we, grains are bad for us, and we didn't evolve to eat them, and all this stuff. And true or false, I don't know. And yet, we have a government-approved food permit that encourages people to eat tons of grains and eat very little meat. When it turns out, we evolved for tons of meat and very little grains. And now there's special interest groups, right? There's the dairy lobby, and there's the grain lobby, and there's the, all these lobbies that are now going to advocate for what, and they keep, they keep changing the food pyramid based on special interest groups, or based on what they think is consensus science. But science doesn't evolve through consensus. It evolves through disagreement. People disagree, and they challenge each other, and they re research, and they fight over this stuff. But we're telling people, eat this diet. Now, in my view, government has no role in telling people what to eat. People should go out and figure it out. And what if the scientists that the government is advocating wrong? I don't know if this causes a beat, but what if it does? This is what happens when you get central planning, right? And it, you know, so they're eating different, we have 50 different cereals, but what if all the 50 different cereals are bad for you? So we get choices between garbage. And we're told you have to eat a cereal for breakfast. That's good for you. And, and it's subsidized. That's true through farm subsidies that David was talking about. Um, and there's a lobby for it. So I would like to see the government get out of this completely, out of these kind of choices. Let individuals make choices with their doctor, with their dietitian, you know, reading whatever, or, or they just go and eat fast food. That's their choice. So in my view, these are choices. And, you know, in a sense, you bring in, there was a part of your question about health care that this relates to. And if they made bad choices, they should have to pay for it. So I think that insurance companies should ha be able to assess whether you're obese or not, and have people should buy their own health insurance, not through group policies, through employers. And if, if you are at a higher risk, they should charge you a higher premium uh, so that there's an incentive to then reduce your risk. We don't provide that incentive. Whether at, at my workplace, whether you're healthy or not healthy, everybody pays the same amount. Today, I was just telling my employees that my younger employees are today subsidizing my kids because uh, Obamacare allows them to be insured under my policy until 26. So uh, my younger employees are subsidizing them. Um, let people have individual health care insurance. Let them bear the costs of their mistakes. Um, you know, and, and just one last point on compassion. If people are so compassionate, and I, I have no problem with compassion. I think it's wonderful. And I think the solution to people without insurance is that compassion through charity. I don't think the government has to get involved. I don't think it got involved pre-86. People used to go to the emergency room. They didn't just die. Every hospital had, them, had a cha charitable foundation that took care of them. You know, guess who lobbied for the 1986 law that made it illegal not to treat somebody who walked into an emergency room? Hospitals did, because they didn't want to bother with charitable foundations. They just wanted to redistribute, the, you know, get, get government money in order to do it. So if everybody's compassionate, then what's the big deal? Why do we need force? I mean, I want... I want, you know, let people be compassionate. I think it's wonderful that people are compassionate, but let's make it voluntary. You want to be compassionate about AIDS in Africa? Give money to AIDS in Africa. You want to help people who don't have health insurance? Give money for a charitable charity that deals with that. Each one of us can then make choices based on our values and how we want to distribute compassion. And, and I'm not arguing here that compassion is hardwired because I'm skeptical about that science, but put that aside. We are compassionate as human beings. That's great. That's part of who we are. Well, let's, let's, express that let's voluntarily. Just, let's, just re let's just remember um, that often we're compassionate, but we don't feel like we have the tools or resources to express our con compassion and solve a problem because it's too big. And I'll give you a concrete example. Um, you know, few groups in America draw more compassion than the elderly, right, who are often old and, fr you know, they're frail. and, and um, uh, vulnerable, and uh, before the uh, expansion of Social Security benefits in the late 60s and early uh, 70s, you know, at the beginning in 1960, about 30 percent of elderly people lived in poverty. Now, this in a country with a lot of churches and a lot of charities and a lot of compassion, but uh, that those institutions and that compassion was not enough to offset a huge problem of elderly poverty. Today, 10% of, of, uh, uh, of under 10% of elderly people live in poverty because of, uh, because of Social Security and because of, of Medicare. And for the, for the elderly in, in this country, that has meant a tremendous amount of freedom. 
of, of individual, you know, old people in America have a level of freedom to do what they want to do and live their lives that was, that was uh, unimaginable in, in earlier gener generations before a strong social safety net. And, uh, and I, I just think we should keep that in mind that one of the things that social insurance systems do is they provide us with a buffer against bad things and they provide us with some basic uh, necessities like income or health care that allow us to then lead our lives and do what we want. And health care is a good, good example of that. You know, in our current system, if you're at a job and you want to go off and start your own business or something, you can't in le without losing your health insurance. And a lot of people don't want to take that risk and they can't afford it in the private market. You know, in, 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 in Europe, which is supposedly, you know, anti-entrepreneurial, anti uh, Sweden and most of Western Europe has a lot higher percentage of people who are self-employed and working in their own small businesses than the United States does. And one of the reasons for that is because of that, those nationalized health systems that allow people to do what they want to do without worrying that they're going to lose their insurance, get sick, and go bankrupt. Um, so I think that, that uh, I think that this move that, that we've seen towards uh, universal health care is very important for freedom. You know, Yaron talked about how great the health care system here is in the United States compared to France or something, uh, even though most French love their health care system, apparently it's horrible, according to Iran. Well, you know, one of the reasons that we have such great care here, at least for the, the people who have insurance, is because we spend twice as much of our national wealth on health care as any other European country. The United States spends 16 to 17 percent of GDP on health care compared to the, the European average, which is like 8 or 9 percent. So we're spending this huge amount of money, uh, and yet still 45 million people don't have any health insurance. 18,000 people die a year uh, by some estimates because they don't have health insurance. We, we you know, are ahead of the, of the Europeans on some health indicators. You know, if you get cancer or something, yeah, it's better than being in the United States, but for other things, it's better to be in, in Europe. We don't devote the resources we should to preventive health care, which produces all sorts of problems. A lot of, of uh, uninsured people don't go to the doctor to, things, to have things caught early. And Yaron's notion that we're going to, that, that health care insurance could be as cheap as your cell phone bill, I'm sorry, but I think that that is pure fantasy because a key, the key driver of health care costs in the United States is technology. It's new technology, it's increasingly advanced technology, and it's the public's appetite for that technology. And that stuff is, 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 uh, is you don't get that for the cost of, uh, you don't get that for the cost of a, of, a, of a cell phone bill. We as a society need to choose, need to decide how much of our national wealth do we want to spend on health care. And, um, uh, and I think that this is one of, the, one of the places where government is really useful. We need to come together as a, as a democratic society and say, you know, hey, do we want to just continue to, to let the market run this system and all, have all this new technology and, and spend you know, ever larger amount of the pie, or do we want to set some limits? And w w one of the things that the Europeans have done well is they've set limits and they have a balance. You know, under 10% of their national wealth goes to health care. They achieve many good results. The public's generally like it. I, I think that that system works better uh, for the most part than what we have here. Okay, uh, at this time I'd like to invite uh, comments from, if you could introduce yourself to 